my dad was like, okay, so it's winter break, Cal, what do you want to do this summer? And we were thinking of different things like interning at a biotech company or getting a job in New England somewhere or sailing across the Atlantic. And then we were like, well, why don't you do it solo? And it's like, yeah, you could do it solo. I don't know how to sail. That's not an issue. You can learn to sail. Talk about courage, confidence, and determination. This is one of the best stories I've ever heard about setting your mind to something, not taking no for an answer, and making it happen. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar, and on this episode of What It's Like To, I talked with a teenager who had an idea to go on a grand adventure and inadvertently set a world record. Last summer, Cal Courier sailed solo across the Atlantic Ocean from Massachusetts to Portugal. And when he left, he didn't even know that at age 16, he was the youngest person ever to do it. Even more incredible, he only began taking sailing lessons six months before. Cal, I really appreciate you being on my podcast. I'm impressed with your accomplishment. Are you 16 or 17 right now? I just turned 17 in December. Okay, but you were 16 when you did this. It was. Can you take me right there. Like, I'm really curious what it was like to be alone in the middle of the ocean sailing for all those days. Describe what that was like. Each day was really a blur. They all blended together so seamlessly because there was no point where one day stopped and the other one began. It's not like day one, day two. It's just days and nights kind of flowing into each other in this really continuous way because the conditions never changed. My view never changed. It was always one continuous horizon it was always the same winds for 19 days until I got to the Azores. It was the same winds, same waves, same tasks to do every day. Nothing would break because the boat we got was so well put together. It was a project boat of a 90-year-old man in Mystic, Connecticut. Really, nothing went wrong in a way that annoyed me because I was like, I want adventure. I want something <laughs> big to happen. I want something to break that I need to fix with my knowledge about this boat. But it didn't happen. I didn't get what I wanted. I just got a boring, super easy trip across the Atlantic. So it sounds like what it more was, was kind of a mind game, like having to stay present and that fixed horizon and the same thing day after day, the groundhog day-ness of it all could kind of play tricks with your head, I would think. How did you deal with that? I'm pretty lucky because I'm ADHD. I'm easily distracted by things and easily entertained by little movements. And then, of course, like you can kind of talk to yourself. It's weird, but like it kind of helps. But the real mind game isn't the boredom because it's just a month, right? Like it's just a month of your life that looks the same every day. That's manageable. It's the loneliness that really gets to you. I am not someone that easily cries and I actually haven't cried since then. But I think it was five days out, I hadn't heard any human voice in that whole time. And I called up my dad. I was doing great. You know, I was happy. I was excited. I was doing it. You know, I was sailing across the night. And he answered the phone. And just hearing the voice, it was funny. It just kind of made me break down. It, it made me break down. Uh. It was the funniest thing. But that point never happened again because I was like, I shouldn't be going five days without hearing another voice. So then I called him every day uh. from that point on. It was lonely in some regards, but I had contact with the outside world, so it wasn't complete solitude. You have to understand, I'd never been alone in open ocean before. Like, I was not a sailor. I had learned to sail seven months prior, kind of four months It's amazing. Prior. And so I had never really done anything like this. I'd never been alone for an extended period of time because I have so many brothers, and so I, I'm always with someone. So I kind of went out with yeah. the expectation that I was going to turn around if I didn't feel comfortable. The first three days, it was pretty, pretty stormy. I was really thinking through like, should I turn around? Does this suck? And I decided <laughs> it did suck. It wasn't fun. It was boring. It was lonely. <laughs> I ran out of books by day three and I didn't have any shows or anything. So I was out of entertainment. I didn't have that much sound to do. And I decided it really sucked. But I also decided it was okay that it wasn't fun. It didn't need to be fun. Um, that wasn't the point of the trip. That wasn't the goal. I didn't do it to have fun. I did it to kind of have an accomplishment. I did it because I was really intrigued by the ocean. I did it out of like a love for adventure, not because I thought the event itself would be fun. So after day three, I decided I can endure 21 more days of this. It'll be fine. Or actually 25 more days. 
I mean, that's amazing perspective to have like, oh, it doesn't just need to be fun. I can see a bigger, a broader perspective here. You mentioned earlier that you burned through the books you brought in the first few days. So what did you do? Just reread them or how did you end up entertaining yourself? Because I was so busy for seven months, I hadn't been reading, I hadn't been watching shows, I hadn't been on TikTok, I hadn't been entertaining myself in any capacity at all, to the point where entertainment was not something that even crossed my mind. So as I was leaving the night before, I was like, you know, I might be kind of bored. I'm going to download five books, you know, just in case I'm bored. And within two hours, I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> so then I read five books in three days. And then I also found I had the Percy Jackson series that had been downloaded on my phone prior. I didn't download it for the trip. I just had it downloaded. So I read that great series. I love that series. It, that's good. And I read that one four times. I read Plato's Republic, oh, wow. Letters of a Stoic, Meditations from just kind of Greek philosophy stuff. Yeah, just little stuff like that. <laughs> oh, it was almost more boring than just being bored, to be quite honest. My thoughts were more entertaining than, than, than meditations, for sure. <laughs> well, it sounds really impressive. <laughs> and and it's also an aspect of trying to, you know, get this boat all figured out and learning about how to manage myself. I decided to do it seven months prior. So then I started spreadsheeting. I started figuring all these things out. And then four months prior, I really started to learn how to sail, tie knots, all that. And then I just kind of left. And it's funny because the task expands to fill the time. And I knew I needed to leave by the 27th of June or else I wasn't going to be able to do it because the storms were kind of coming and hurricane season starts. Okay. So we decided June 27th was the last I could leave. And I left on June 27th. That's when I was ready to leave. I couldn't have left a day sooner. And yeah. it's just funny how your task expands to fill the time that you've given yourself. Yeah, yeah. It all just works out. And you say, this is the day. Okay, so th you're a couple days in and you say, it does sort of suck, but yeah. I am going to keep going. And so then you're out there, you've mm -hmm. read all your books, and then you just keep going? So I just keep going. So what happens is there was a large storm system, a high that was moving across the Atlantic kind of slowly, but it had very strong winds and I was below it which means the winds were coming down to me. I was in the perfect rain, so I had perfect wind the whole time, all coming from the same direction 24-7. The issue is I had really, really big waves, almost 20 feet tall. Like, it's hard to imagine how big oh. these waves were. And my boat was 30 feet long, like huge, huge waves. It's hard to kind of say I would wake up in the morning because I was always in a state of really low-level consciousness because you don't need to be a high-functioning person on a trip like this. But at no point can you have zero consciousness, right? So sleeping is really dangerous because you always need to be watching for something that would break or if you go off course. Luckily, I had instruments that would let me know if I might hit something like another boat or the land. No, there is no land out there. So that, that wasn't an issue. <laughs> I wasn't concerned about hitting other boats at all, which means I just needed to make sure I was on course and nothing broke. So I needed to always have this low level of consciousness. I just needed to be a potato for 28 days. That was the task. The task was not to sail because I had such perfect conditions. I was very lucky in this regard. I would have been prepared if I had not had good conditions because we prepared a lot, but I did. So I would kind of wake up, you know, I slept 90 minute increments so that I could always kind of keep an eye on things, but I'd wake Ugh. up from my last sleep of the night and I'd have music playing 24 seven. I'd play solitaire. Now, of course, the boat was really pitchy because of the waves. So the cards would slide off all the time, which was annoying. Oh, you play actual solitaire, not like on a device. <laughs> yeah, just solitaire because I didn't have like... I talked to people because I could talk to people on the phone. It was not great. There was about an eight second delay between what I said and their response. And I could text people, but I had no service other than that. So I couldn't watch shows or anything. I'd kind of just play with things. I'd clean the boat. I cleaned the boat so much. I wouldn't eat that much. I wasn't nauseous, but I was at this low level of like, I'm not hungry. Right. So I went two days without eating. I lost 15 pounds in 28 days. Wow. Um, now, what about that sleep deprivation? I can't imagine only sleeping in 90 minute increments and sort of just low level sleep, not ever solid sleep. Did you feel like that really got to you? Or did you feel like you were never kind of at peak alertness because you never really got great sleep? I will say this, it might have saved me. Because if I had been at peak mental capacity, I probably would have driven myself crazy. Because <laughs> I would have been thinking of everything. And because I was so tired that I wasn't really thinking anything, just like 
nothing's breaking, nothing's breaking, wind looks good, sales look good, we're keeping going, right? That's all my brain was capable of thinking, which means it really was hard for me to drive myself crazy because I was so tired. That's so interesting. You almost just kind of got in your own little zone to just keep moving forward. Yeah. And it's funny, it didn't feel like moving forward, right? Because I had on my little map, oh yeah, you've made 500 miles of progress. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, Every day has looked the same since day one. So like, what does that mean, computer? What does that mean? I think it ended up being 3,600 miles. And it didn't feel like that. It just felt like I was sitting in a time capsule for 21 days. And then I got off the boat in Portugal. (laughs) Was there ever a time that you thought I'm not going to make it? Like now I'm stranded in the middle of the ocean. Well, not stranded, because like you said, you had communication with your parents and other people. You could get out. But did you think like, I can't keep going. This is too far. I can't just keep going in this mode. The real kind of brilliance of this project wasn't me sailing across the Atlantic. It was the preparations that would make it impossible for me to die doing so. So if the rudder had broke, my only steering mechanism, I had a backup rudder. Uh If my automatic steering system broke, I had two backup automatic steering systems. If the sail broke, I had another sail. If the jib broke, I had another jib. Every single piece of this boat had a redundancy. So there was nothing other than the keel that could break, in which case I would not be able to keep moving forward. And if anything did break, I had contact with the outside world, which would make it possible for a cargo ship to come get me. So there was no point where I was like, oh, I can't go on. There was one point that was dangerous where, again, huge waves something at the very tip, the very bow of the boat broke and I had to go fix it. This was the one time something broke in the whole trip and I went up to fix it and the waves were washing over the bow. So I was up there, I was strapped in, but there was waves hitting me. And across this whole trip, there were these Portuguese man of war jellyfish every 30 feet. They were everywhere. Oh, It was very interesting. They're just these little bubbles. They're these little purple bubbles that are floating in the water. And the waves were coming over me. And I realized 10 feet to my left, a Portuguese man of war, not even 10 feet, Portuguese man of war passed me, washed onto my boat behind me and then washed off. And I realized if I was hit by one, I'd probably pass out from being electrocuted and the waves would keep hitting me and I might fall off the boat and then get slammed against the side and maybe die. So that was the real stress point. But I just fixed a thing. It took 30 minutes. And, you know, if I'd had five more of those stressful events happen, I would have kept going and it would have been great. And I I wish I did, but no. So you wanted more of these, like you said, adventurous things. But then you had your parents back home who were probably thinking, thank goodness. Yeah. And also I wanted it to fit with the image of the Atlantic trip that I had in my head, right? What I wanted was to be standing on the bow of the boat screaming into the storm like Poseidon is this all you've got and I was like just (laughs) sitting below you know saying damn it Poseidon is this all you've got like come on man give me some challenges come on (laughs) so these 20 foot waves weren't challenges that sounds incredible to me no you just get used to them right because it's not like they hit you at once first it's no waves Uh one foot waves then five foot waves then 10 foot waves, right? And it just happens gradually over a couple of days to the point where it's like, yeah, I'm going up and down a lot, but I'm used to it. I don't feel seasick. They lasted for, I think, 11, 12 days. And I just really got used to it. The one thing that would really bug me was there were um, electrical cords moving around inside the mast. And anytime the boat would move, they would clink up against the side of the mast quite loudly. So it made it difficult to sleep. When I was trying to sleep, it would make it difficult because there was this obnoxious clink, clink. And I knew when it was coming because the way the boat would move means I know what sound the clink would make. So then I was like anticipating it, right? Because if it was completely random, my brain would be able to say, oh, there was a clink. But it was like, oh, there's going to be one. And then it came, right? So it was almost more distracting. The anticipation would make it quite distracting. So now what about food? What kept you going nourishment wise? So when I bought the boat, it came with a whole bunch of the freeze dried food that you then reheat with water, which we were like, okay, it'll be backup food. You know, if all goes to hell, we brought a whole bunch of canned food, a whole bunch of ramen. Turns out doing dishes is a pain. So I had a pot and I didn't want to be putting my canned food in the pot, heating it up and then eating it because then I need to do the dish. But if I just put boiling water in there, then it was all good. 
So what I ended up doing is I ended up eating mainly the freeze dried food that we bought with the boat. It was very, very good. It tasted like a like three course meal. Every single packet, mashed potatoes <laughs> and chicken and macaroni and cheese, and it was just like, oh wow, this is really good. Your standards but, were a little lower than normal, probably. Yeah, and then when I just wanted a snack, I'd just open up a can and just eat it right out of the can, like clam chowder or beef stew, whatever. So let's go back a little to the original idea. I read that you were just kind of brainstorming with your family, like what would be a fun thing to do this summer? I mean, most people say like, let's go hiking or something. Can you kind of walk us through how this evolved? I know your family are sailors. So this came less from my family being sailors more than my family having a mentality where it's like, you got to start early, right? So we were at a point where my dad was like, okay, so it's winter break. Cal, what do you want to do this summer? Like you could get a job, you could make some money. You could get an internship at a startup or another great place that would really give you some experience and kind of be really good looking on your resume. Or you could do something just really fun and amazing. Go on a trip, go around the world, travel somewhere. And we were thinking of different things like that, interning at a biotech company or getting a job in New England somewhere or sailing across the Atlantic. And then we were like, well, (laughs) why don't you do it solo? And it's like, yeah, I could do it solo. I don't know how to sail. That's not an issue. You can learn to sail. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And and we also have another philosophy. I love that. You know, I don't know how to sail, but I can do it. There's this really great philosophy that I learned on the trip and that my dad's always had, which is that if someone says it's going to take a certain amount of time to do something, if you really put your mind to it, you can do it in like a tenth of the time. Because experienced sailors take six years to get ready to sail across the Atlantic. $300,000. They get teams, they get press and everything, and they sail across the Atlantic. It's like, you can do it with seven months and 20 grand. Easy. And I had four people. It was me, my dad, my grandfather, and the guy we bought the boat from. That's really who helped on this. Everyone else was resistant. And my grandfather was resistant. He was like, I don't know that this is a good idea because he's done it twice. And all the big sailors that have done this see me doing it as an insult, right? Because... They worked their whole life to be able to do something. And then I'm insulting them by saying, guys, it's not that hard. And the truth is, it's not that hard. Right. It was hard. (laughs) It used to be hard. It used to be a great thing. But now it's not because of technology. And people don't realize Ah. that. And so this was an insult to a lot of people. So there was a whole bunch of resistance. So I didn't publicize it at all until after I'd already done it because nobody wanted to hear that it was going on. They all said, this is an awful idea. Like, you're dumb for this. And... The math that I had done inside my head told me, no, it's doable. It can be safe. That is so interesting. And I'd explain every single point. They'd see like, what about this danger? And I'm like, I've thought about that. This is how I'd respond to it. What about this danger? I've thought of that. This is how I respond to it. And no matter how much we did that, they couldn't rationalize it in their head. They just couldn't wrap their head around it because it didn't conform to their view of the world. And it was really interesting. And people say, oh, it's a great trip. In my mind, it wasn't because... It wasn't something amazing. It wasn't something big because I just lived with the idea of doing it for so long that it became something small. And you do attribute so much of that to the advanced technology compared to 30 years ago when someone might have taken this on. Oh, five years ago, I couldn't have done it. Mm. Like technology is just amazing. The advancements that have been made make it so that, yes, I'm sailing, but at the same time, so much of it is For example, one technology that you don't normally think of when you think of sailing technology is YouTube. I spent hundreds of hours on YouTube watching videos on how to solo sail, how to sail, how to do this, how to do that, how to fix this, how to fix that. Wow. So these technologies come in every form, right? The communications with the Iridium satellites, the automatic steering system backups, the water cleaners, like everything is just at a point where things have become easy. But you still did have to learn so much. I read that you spent every day of every weekend for months devoting yourself to this. When I say it's easy, I mean it's easier than people believe it to be. I spent every waking hour for seven months thinking about this, right? And you can't do it if you don't have that. But people think it's like a life's goal to sail across the Atlantic when it can be a year's goal. And can you talk about the west to east versus east to west? Because yours was the quote unquote hard way going west to east. So there's this big wind trend across the Atlantic, right? So if you have America here and you're up here, wind does this. It goes in a clockwise manner 
it's the, called the great circle route and the route that every person that has been younger than me has taken is taking the bottom of it. And when we started, we were like, I'm going to sail across the Atlantic. It's not that deep. You can do it either way. But then we learned that there have been two or three people that were younger than me, for sure, that we know of. There's probably definitely more, but that we know of. Of course, everyone's heard of Laura Decker. She's the youngest. She was 14 when she did it. And then her family just got, I think, sued or something for child endangerment. Crazy story. But oh. then there was another kid who was even younger than that. But his dad was like a mile behind him in another boat the whole time, kind of shadowing him. So it didn't really count. Mm. If I knew it had been safer to go east to west, I probably would have. But at the same time, all our resources, my grandfather, who's an amazing sailor, and just everything kind of we have is on the east coast. So it's kind of better to start from there um, and end up in Portugal. Again, we weren't really going for any record. I thought I'd be maybe the 50th person to have done this. I thought it was kind of a thing because it was like, oh, wow, this is really easy. How have not more people done this? But it turns out not a lot of people have done it because everyone thinks it's hard when it's not. Yeah, that, that, that was that story. So you undertook this. You didn't even know until, I don't know, you were part way or you had finished or mm -hmm. something that you were setting a world record for the youngest oh, yeah, person no, I, to ever do this. I didn't care to be quite honest it's not about the record it was just about the adventure i mean i feel like that's kind of the coolest part of the whole thing like that's just the icing on top of the cake yeah. that wasn't the whole point of it it was the adventure it was the journey yeah and we were thinking about you know at no point could we have any fanfare for it right because again when i left i didn't know if i'd actually be leaving or whether i'd just turn back in three days and if we'd had a whole send-off party with a cake and ribbons then I would feel pressured not to be able to turn back. So I just had, I think, seven or eight people on the dock just saying, good luck, you know, see you in three days. We'll have dinner ready for you when you uh -huh. get home. There was no great adventure, right? It was just Cal and his boat. Tell me about convincing your parents to do this. How on board were they, so to speak, with this idea? It sounds like so your right dad from was. Yeah, right from the get-go, my dad was for it. My mom said, yeah, you know, we'll see how it goes. But the more and more likely it became to actually happen, the more stress you got about it. And I remember there was this one night when my mom and my dad, this was, I think, one or two nights before I left. And they went out and they took a drive and they were gone for a good four hours. And <laughs> it's a long drive. they got back, my mom was like, all right, I think I get your guys' math now. I get why you think it will be safe while everyone else doesn't. So only two days before was my mom actually on board with it. And it also is a factor that her parents, who are accomplished sailors, were not on board with it. Now, I think they were not on board with oh. it, not because they were genuinely worried about safety. Well, they were, but I think subconsciously they were also being upstaged a little bit. So that's another reason why they weren't for it. So that was also a factor. But in the end, it was the last couple of days when my mom was really on board with it. She would have let it happen either way, but she wouldn't have been happy. But then in the last two days, she really got on board with it. You said that you talked to your dad throughout the journey. What did your mom say? How she felt throughout? Like, was she nervous during those 28 days? I talked to both of them a lot. I could call either of them and I did. It was my understanding that they would not pick up their phone without checking where I was. They had a tracker on me to see where I was. It was my understanding that they did not go a single hour without checking where I was. I have a daughter just a year younger than you, so it's kind of amazing for me to imagine her going off this coming summer to do this thing. It does seem quite adventurous and bold, so well, I applaud you, know, you and I applaud them. <laughs> I started learning about the whole sailing thing in about a year ago, a week from now. So. Wow. If you wanted, your daughter could start learning right now. She could do it. She could go right now and be the, the next youngest person. <laughs> yeah, she could start learning right now and she could do it by summertime. What characteristics do you think you have that others maybe don't that would compel you to have undertaken this? Do you think of yourself as particularly calm under pressure or you did say adventure seeking or... I think that in general, I have proven to be a generally calm under pressure kind of person. 
a lot of people have a natural fear of the ocean. My twin brother does. He's not a big fan of the ocean. I made it clear from the get-go. I was going to do it solo. Unless my twin brother wanted to do it with me, I would have done it with him. But uh -huh. he didn't want to just because of the ocean. And I'm not naturally afraid of it. I wasn't naturally nauseous. And adrenaline is dopamine. So being stressed is, is fun. And I'm not really afraid easily, which is good. I've got that, that lucky disposition. So I think you said after about 25 days, you made it to the Azores, which is an island chain west of Portugal. So what happened there? You docked the boat for a little bit? Yeah. So my plan was to go there, stay for three days. I was like, I'm going to finally see people. I'm going to be so relieved. I'm going to step off and feel like I'm home. And then I'm going to, you know, take hikes and stretch my legs and get back in shape and eat good food. And I got there. <laughs> No one really spoke English and the food was not amazing. <laughs> and I took a epic hike and I was just exhausted because I hadn't worked out in 20 days and hadn't done any movement at all. And then I hear of a big storm system coming to Portugal in 17 days, 40 knot winds were going to hit the coast of Portugal. And if that happened, if that storm got there before I got there, I would have been screwed. So the plan was either Cal needs to wait in the Azores for 20 days or Cal needs to leave today, today, or at least as soon as possible. I didn't want to give myself like a little bit of wiggle room. I wanted as much wiggle room as possible. So what happened was I arrived in Portugal. I docked my boat at eight o'clock exactly at night. And then 24 hours later to the minute I left, uh. I bought seven boxes of Mac and cheese. I had sat at the animal shelter for a little bit and pet the cats and dogs. And I picked up and left. I refueled, got more water and just left. And then how were those last few days? Did you avoid the storm? Um, I did. There was a storm system leaving Portugal going eastward and I wanted to catch it. So the first couple days I was in very low wind. So I actually turned on my motor for a little bit. Now I had gotten in the habit of turning on the motor for the, the engine for 10 minutes every day not really propelling myself, just making sure that it was still working in case I needed it. So at that point, I turned it on and I left it running for a little while, kind of pushing myself through this really quiet zone because, I, again, I didn't want to waste any time. If I knew I had time, I definitely would have wanted to not use the motor, but I didn't want to get caught in the storm. So I got myself mm. to the tail end of the storm. And then for three days, I had good 25 knot winds, which is high. It's pretty high. And I just kind of rode that through. It was raining for four days. And so I didn't go outside much, really. And then I got to Portugal. The shipping lanes are really dangerous. So I made sure I was always awake when I went through the shipping lanes. The last four days were certainly like entertaining. So the post Azores trip felt like a completely different sail. Because I actually had to do sailing. And that's all that stuff that you were prepared for. Like you knew there were going to be shipping lanes and none yeah. of that was a surprise. Yeah, not a surprise at all. So AIS, Consents Other Boats. You can see how many boats are within, I think it was 47 miles of me. And generally it would be one or zero. When I was in a shipping lane within one hour, it was zero up to 97 boats like oh, that wow. were being sensed around me. And these boats were like, huge cargo ships, boats that would not see yeah. me and crash into me. I, I mean, you know, I made it through. Uh, I didn't even need to adjust my course at any point to avoid a boat. I just kind of went through. A lot of people tell me, oh man, you don't even know how lucky you are. And I'm like, trust me, I know exactly how lucky I am. Like I've done the math. I should not have been that lucky. I know I would have made it even if I wasn't, but like I got really lucky for sure. What do you mean lucky? Winds, unknown factors. So much stuff can go wrong on a boat and nothing went wrong. Like, it's so uh, rare. It's very rare for that to happen. So you ended up in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And who was there? What was that like? Uh, my brother, there? my mom, and my dad were all there waiting. It was weirdly anticlimactic. I kind of got off the boat, and I, I was like, okay, now I need to deal with people again. Now I need to talk and have social skills, which I had lost over the course of a month. What did you look forward to? Steak. Meat. I, I'm ashamed to say it. Food. Yeah. You were going to say it was feeling anticlimactic. Was there something more you yeah. wanted to say on that? Just the whole thing. 
like you expect to come off and kneel on the ground and kiss it and like you know oh people again it was like a month is not enough time to forget people it's not enough time to to be driven insane by you know lack of human contact it's just not enough time for that so i got off and i was like okay it's just been a couple of days since i've seen you guys how's it going you know how you been our cousin got married how was that how was the wedding <laughs> which i missed <laughs> So for me, it wasn't a big moment. It doesn't stand out in my memories as being some big thing. Was there a time during the trip or afterwards that you felt like, wow, I'm learning a lot about myself or about life? Or did that come afterwards? Did you have any big reflective moments? Yeah. So I'll say during, again, because I was so sleep deprived, I didn't have a whole bunch of cognitive abilities. So I wasn't doing a whole bunch of Mm -hmm. learning about myself or life lessons while I was on the boat. But afterwards, I guess I really just reflected on not myself, but more society and how Mm. misconstrued everything is in terms of just people's narrative about what a hard task is and how kind of sad it is how so many kids won't be able to live amazing events just because they're said to be hard, even when they aren't. And also, I really reflected on parenting. And the real heroes of this weren't me, but my parents for breaking the mold because so many kids would want to do what I've done. So many. But it's not that they can't or that they don't want to. It's just that their parents won't let them. It's the parenting of society today that's really the issue, not the drive of the kids. And, you know, it's really understandable because parents just want the best for their kids. And often their mental math says that putting them in a boat in the middle of the ocean is not what's best for them. That is the narrative. And in so many cases, that's the wrong narrative to have. (laughs) When I got off the boat, all I really felt was pride for my parents. Like, wow, these guys really let me do something amazing that really so many kids could do, but no one's allowing them to do it. So my parents were just the ones that let me do it. That's why I'm the first. It's not because I'm special. It's because my parents are special. That's really sweet. That's really thoughtful of you. And uh, I think it's a combination. Of course, you got to do it because they allowed you to, but you also had the drive and the ambition and the stick to You actually went out and did it. So it's a great combination that you guys had there. It was a wonderful adventure. When I went in, I said, I'm going to sail across the Atlantic and then be done with sailing. I'll start and finish, you know, swallow the anchor. And I kind of started my high school race team at Palo Alto. And- so is your hope now to kind of get other people as interested in sailing as you've become. I thought I had read that you were um, maybe going to sail next summer, but then you sold the boat or something. But is that not right? We're trying to sell the boat. You're not done sailing. We're trying very hard to sell the boat. And if we don't, I'll just take a trip through the med, get some friends, sail around, see what happens. Normally it goes sailing with people and then sailing solo and then back to people again because sailing solo is no fun. I just kind of skipped the first step. So I learned to sail solo. And then now I want to be sailing with people because sailing solo remains to be no fun. You check that box big time. (laughs) Honestly, in terms of managing a boat, I like to be alone because I know that everything I'm doing, you know, I'm doing right. So I got it. But sailing next to people is really nice. And I'd say, I don't know how much I'd like to be in tight confines with another person. And if I were to take another really long, trans-Pacific or do a full circumnavigation, I'd probably want to continue to do it solo. I like managing the boat on my own, but being alone is not a fun part. Do you foresee doing that ever? Trans-Pacific or Potentially. The world? If college doesn't shape up to be what I would want it to be, I still own the boat. At that point, I'd uh, probably do a full circumnavigation. Yeah. How long would that take? If I you know? put my mind to it, I could do it in a year. Yeah, a little longer than wow. a year. Well, thanks, Cal. This has really been fun for me. Thanks for uh, sharing all your adventures. And I look forward to cheering you on for whatever you do next. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. As impressive as Cal's accomplishment is, I was equally impressed by his character. And also, seriously, my hat is off to Cal's parents, too, for their courage and for supporting Cal along his journey. Here are some of my takeaways from our conversation. Number one, not everything is fun. Not everything needs to be. Often there are other motivating factors. For Cal, it was love of the ocean, adventure. Think about what motivates you. Two, trust your own internal compass, so to speak. 
Just because others say something can't be done or can only be done a certain way doesn't mean you can't do it your way. Three, we're made for community. Solitude is one thing, loneliness is another. Try not to go too long without hearing another person's voice. Four, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Prepare as well as you can before undertaking any venture, and chances are you'll have a more successful voyage. And finally, number five, seek adventures and support others to pursue their seemingly wild dreams. My huge thanks to Cal Courier for sharing his stories with me. There's a link to a great video of his journey in the show notes to this episode, which you can find on my website, whatitslike2.net. You can also find all of our past episodes there. If you like stories about adventure, you might want to listen to episode 11, when Jeff Gottfer shared what it was like to summit Mount Everest, and episode 14 about running ultra marathons with Sarah Lavender Smith. If you're not already following us on social media, please do. And please tell a few friends about this podcast too. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar. Thanks for being curious about what it's like.